Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon, and I'm here with a very special guest this evening, newly minted A&P mechanic, Jake Simon. How are you doing? Good, good. So uh, literally, when we say newly minted, we're talking like, what, less than 24 hours? Yesterday afternoon. <laughs> less than 24 hours with a big thanks going out to Benny Britt, the FAA designated examiner that uh, helped us. We are here down at Mallards Air Park in Locust Grove, Georgia, staying with our good friend Paul Morell and Teresa Morell. Um, this, I have to tell you, this living on an air park and especially Mallards Landing, this particular air park, is absolutely stunning. Isn't it amazing? Oh, yeah. It's fabulous. It's it's like Disney World for pilots. Mm -hmm. There's always planes flying above, uh, extras. There was a cool Lockheed that came yesterday. Yeah, uh, just for a low pass. Yeah. We just happened to be out there. Um, Paul has this absolutely gorgeous kit fox that he built, and um, he was giving us rides and showing us around the area. And in between that, uh, all of a sudden, Lockheed Electra um, just uh, came in and buzzed the runway, and it was it was just amazing. Mm -hmm. There's an extra flying. Yep. It seems like every time you turn around, steermen's, helicopters, you name it, they're all going around here. And this is where you came for your uh, testing. So we're going to talk tonight a little bit about that as well on um, how to become a mechanic as well as do-it-yourself maintenance because that's what we're here for. Now, before we get started with tonight's broadcast, as always, we got to cover a few basics. Uh, tonight's show will be recorded and available on our YouTube channel. Just search for Social Flight, one word, Social Flight, on YouTube, and uh, you should find our channel. You can subscribe, see things about our T-51 Mustang build, and get more information, be able to watch uh, this episode again, especially if you want to pause on certain screens that we're going to show that give you information on what is legal to do on uh, your own aircraft. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, some developments and hopefully give you some tips in doing that. Now, this is kind of an experiment. We usually have um, uh, regular, you know, just regular guests on the show, fascinating people from throughout general aviation. And uh, we wanted to get feedback from you, so feel free to post your questions in the Q&A feature and uh, we'll respond to those as best possible. Uh, during the broadcast. We'll try to fit those in and let us know what you think about uh, a show that has to do with taking questions and do-it-yourself maintenance because uh, we can't cover that much. We could talk obviously for about a week about everything that you can do on your plane and how to do it and teach you how to do it. That uh, Doing that and there's a series called the Educated Owner Video Series is how I actually got started in aviation. And, and so we could cover that for a long time, but we're just going to cover some of the basics now and get started. And with positive feedback from you, if you'd like to see more, we'll have more shows like this. And we'll get into really more in, into the nitty gritty um, as we do that. Now, I want to do one other thing and uh, just uh, show really quickly um, the, uh, where we are with the Fly to Win Challenge as we get in. I'm going to open up and turn on the other screen here. So last month uh, from our partner Tempest, Te uh, Tempest makes some fantastic products. We had a prize pack that was given away. If you have the Social Flight free mobile app, and you just fly to anywhere, at least one place, it'll check in and give you points and enter you to win in this, and we call that the Fly to Win Challenge. And so we gave away this fantastic Tempest Aero prize pack, and we are currently in the middle of a contest. We are nearing the end. You still have some time left to go and fly and actually uh, win a Zulu 3 as well. So check that out um, and be sure to fly. So with that, Jake, you ready to get started? Yeah, let's go. Okay, let's talk maintenance. Um, now, uh, We've well, we've got a little tale. There's there's uh, uh, what did it take us to uh, get here to the show tonight? So uh, we flew down to tour Clemson, um, actually for Ben, my brother, and uh, going to tour the school. We get back to the plane because um, we flew from here, and we notice that the right tire is uh, a little bit more flat than the other. So we go to investigate and realize that um, a little bit lower, a little bit more flat, like we're used to having flats. <laughs> It was flat. <laughs> so we did more investigation, realized that we had a leak and had to uh, drive all the way down here. 
pick up a part and then we we're gonna drive all the way back so it's about a three hour 15 minute drive back here to do the show right so when we're talking about maintenance we've got some real examples to talk to you about because we are here with a rental car <laughs> down in the air park and our airplane never made it back from clemson and we're gonna go do all the things we're talking about tonight tomorrow yep to continue the rest of the uh of the tour of seeing colleges for ben um so what i'd like to do is go and 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 talk about the basics. Um, we want to really quickly, and I say that because I want to have time in the show for some of the other things uh, and get into some real meat and details for you all, um, but I want to cover the basics of what are the regulations of what you can do on your own airplane. And the way that the FAA does it is they, they separate out when you look at the regulations of what is What's a major alteration? What's minor alterations? You know, what can be done by different people? And then in AC 4313, Appendix A of the Federal Aviation Regulations, is this section called preventive, preventive maintenance. Preventive maintenance is right. I'm going to quiz you a bit through this now that you've just got your A&P, right? Okay. <laughs> and what they do is they list out what you see here, which is really important. And then, we'll, of course, we'll take these slides off the screen in a bit, but I want to cover some of this. And uh, what it says is preventive maintenance is limited to the following work, provided it does not involve complex assembly operations. So the FAA goes and lists out, in this case, 31 items now. When I first got started, it used to be 32. Mm -hmm. We'll explain that. 31 items that you can do on your own aircraft. And then there's a little catch at the end we're gonna talk about that actually opens it up and lets you work on some more. Mm -hmm. So I wanna run through them really quickly. So the first one, removal, installation, and repair of landing gear tires. Why? Because that's the only thing that's gonna get us out of Clemson. Yes. Right, so, uh, that okay. The reason. <laughs> that's the reason. So that's number one. Number two is replacing elastic shock absorber cords on landing gear. Number three is servicing landing gear shock, absor uh, shock struts. You can add oil, air, or both to them. Uh, you can service landing gear, landing gear uh, bearings. You can clean them. You can grease them. Uh, def uh, replace defective safety wiring or cotter keys. And then they kind of have this broad one for all sorts of lubrication, as long as you don't have to disassemble um, like anything that's structural. If you're only disassembling non-structural things, cowling, uh, um, you know. Cover plates and cowlings and other things. Right, like exactly. Yeah. You're not taking some critical structure apart to, uh, to lubricate it. Um, if you have fabric aircraft, you can do uh, patches. You can replenish uh, hydraulic fluid in the reservoir. Um, there's decorative coatings that you can do. You can look through this. Um, and then preservative, anything that has to do with protective or preservative materials on um, where again, what, one of the things you'll see in all these is they talk a lot about complex and they talk a lot about um, uh, uh, primary structures. So a primary structure of the aircraft, something that if it's, you know, damaged, if it's, uh, uh, you can look up, there's an actual definition, of course, to this. But when, if you want to think about it in layman's terms, it, it's things that are absolutely critical to flight, not things that can have cracks in them or dents in them and mm -hmm. not really affect anything. Um, critical primary structures of the aircraft cause this. Um, and, um, and then when you go through number 11, we got upholstery and decorative finishes, um, simple repairs to fairings and things mm -hmm. like that. Side windows, they have to see, you know, side windows, they can do not consider to be primary structures in most aircraft, as long as they're not pressurized. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then seats, seat, pel uh, seat parts. Then we get into some interesting things here that um, that we've learned a lot about and have changed in the last 10 years even. Um, and that is some things interesting, like number 16 here is troubleshooting and repairing broken circuits in landing light wires, <laughs> wiring circuits. So they called out like only landing lights. And for for a long, long time, it was like, well, preventive maintenance, anything else that's a bad wire, you can't touch. Only if it's a landing light. Yeah. Navigation so light. Nav lights you can't do. Any other recognition lights you can't do. Right. Um, I believe even uh, like changing a light bulb inside the cockpit. Um, so they strictly Yeah, said, your dome light, right? Yeah, dome lights and other <laughs> things like that. 
And that was the way things were. Uh, taking the cowling on and off, certainly. Spark plugs and spark plug gaps. Um, replacing hoses. Now, what's interesting on this one, right, and we're going to come back to these, but um, uh, they say any hose except hydraulic connections. Now, what they I think they're getting at here has to do with like, like high pressure systems, like hydraulic fluids um, that can be a thousand, maybe even three thousand psi, depending on what aircraft it is. Right, and and I think the other thing is they're thinking here about that word. Remember, two words that are key to them: mm -hmm. primary structures mm -hmm. and complex complex operations. Yeah, and any time you know when you go do something like uh, replace an, a, a line, a vacuum line for for let's say for your uh, uh, for your vacuum system, you replace an oil hose uh, or something like that. You just pretty much replace most of these, and the system will work. Mm -hmm. Not so true for hydraulic systems, mm -hmm. and that can be this uh, the same like with brake systems where you have to bleed the brakes where the um, very active you trying to replace a line means a whole nother uh, series of events that you have to do in order to return it back to service. So I think that's what they're trying to get at when they're referring to complex operations. Yeah, because like, like I said, you it doesn't end there. Yeah, it's not you just replacing the Lead the system, yeah. get air out of it, things that are critical to safety of flight, and then it starts getting into like a little more co complexity. Um, we were talking about here uh, uh, non-structural, uh, we've got batteries, uh, fuel and oil strainers and filter uh, uh, elements. They talked about prefabricated fuel lines. As long as you're not doing the complex operation of making a line, yep. you can change a fuel line. Yep. Um, and, and by the way, let me really clarify this. We are, we're here to talk about do-it-yourself maintenance. And so all of the items that we're talking about tonight are the regulation is the owner or operator of the aircraft can do these things. We're here talking to you as an owner or an operator. You can be the pilot or you can own the aircraft. And then you can do these things with the catch-all that this is part of part 91 operations. You operate your aircraft under part 135 or something mm -hmm. else like that? Nope, none of this counts. Yeah. This is for the vast majority of folks out there who own their own aircraft or are flying one that's uh, in the partnership or that someone lets them fly. Mm -hmm. These are the things that you can actually do. Uh, there's stuff in here about balloon baskets, anti-misfueling devices, um, uh, magnetic chip detectors. That's a little more common on helicopters. Um, and then we're getting towards the end here. And uh, there's stuff for primary category aircraft. We won't get into too much detail here, but basically if a manufacturer, if you own a primary category aircraft, there's a couple, there's a few of those out there, not many. Um, the manufacturer can tell you certain things. And then certain... Uh, removal and replacement of front instrument um, uh, mounted equipment that as long as it's in a tray you can take it out have someone repair replace whatever and you can slide it back in um, again as long as it's not going to put you in violation of like a transponder so uh, we're running I know very uh, uh, fast through a long list but that's because we really want to talk about this in more detail and not just read a list to you all night. Um, so this is this list. And, and, and so the FAA has come up with these, these 31 items and said, uh, this is it. This is the preventive maintenance list exactly as we've seen, say, done it. If you're not a mechanic, if you're an owner or operator, part 91, this is it. And that is how people operated for decades underneath that. Mm -hmm. decades. Um, lo and behold, 2009 comes around and there's this operation. I'm going to flip the screen to this. There's this, uh, this operation that's flying a Learjet. And uh, what's interesting, the way the FAA works is you have the regulations and then you also have guidance materials that are out there that, uh, for, that we get from the FAA. Um, which are not law, but they're the way that the FAA uh, kind of gives guidance, mm -hmm. advisory circulars. Yeah. We get these all the time, ACs. Mm -hmm. And then 4313 itself is an AC. Um, and then you can actually request a legal interpretation from the FAA if you need a ruling on something you believe is uh, a, a gray and, and it just, you want to know that you're right 
You want something official. And uh, some people go to their FISDOs for this, their local FISDO, mm -hmm. and we've heard it all throughout general aviation. You get one answer from one FISDO, you get another answer from mm -hmm. another FISDO. <laughs> um, and so writing a letter and asking for a legal interpretation from the FAA is how you resolve that. And so back in 2009, you had this thing called the Khalil letter. And this is where this, this part 91, even though it's part 91, operators of a Learjet, I think it was a Lear 60, they wanted to understand uh, there was a requirement for adding air, checking the air pressure in the tires of the Learjet prior to flight every single time. And the question became, can adding air to those tires, mm -hmm. what is that? Is that just a pre-flight uh, operation? Is that, um, is that preventive maintenance that the pilot can do as the operator of the aircraft? Or is that maintenance that only a licensed A and B mechanic mm -hmm. can do? And the reason that this was complicated is because on a Learjet, you're talking about not only a bigger aircraft, but very high pressure. Uh, it's over 200 pounds. Um, it, the, the manufacturer had said it's incredibly important that this is done by a calibrated gauge. It really started to get into the area of are you what is this? Because there's a lot of specifics. We need to make sure we get it right. And the FAA came out with something fascinating as a response to this question that came in for legal interpretation that has uh, ramifications for all of us in general aviation and has had since 2019. So for like 12, 11 years, this existence of this response has changed everything. And here's what they said basically here. They said that preventive maintenance, I don't want to read the whole thing to, to you, but, what, but what's key about this letter, and you can look it up, is that preventive maintenance is defined to mean, as we said earlier, simple or minor preservation operations and the replacement of small standard parts not involving complex assembly operations. And when they did their interpretation, they said, hey, you know, we see these items, these 32 items at the time, it was 32, that were listed here, and we know that it says preventive maintenance is limited to the following work. However, we believe that such limitation is not controlling. That was huge in itself. That means they invalidated the idea that we are limited to these 32 items. So we believe that this is not, is, is not this limitation is not controlling. And similarly, for the same reason, we believe that the following sentence, which is also in, in, in uh, part 43, 12a, that says, if a task or maintenance function does not appear on that list, it is not preventive maintenance. They also overruled that one. And they said, as with the other paragraphs, these lists are better viewed as examples of the tasks in each category. They cannot be considered all-inclusive. There are no doubt many simple or minor preservation operations or tasks that were, or the replacement of non-standard parts not involving complex assembly operations that are performed daily, especially on general, small general aviation aircraft, that they would consider preventive maintenance even though they're not on the list. So that, I'm gonna turn that, uh, the uh, screen off for that uh, for a minute uh, and go back to us. That's the foundation for everything about what you can do on your own aircraft and what you can. Think about in primary structure, think about complex or non-complex operations, and the new interpretation that we all should be following is, let's look at these 31 items, and by the way, the last one that we keep talking about, that what it used to be 32, was updating databases. And that was changed about not even that many years ago, a few years ago. Um, and database operations used to be a maintenance task. And so we can now look at these things and think to ourselves, what, what else can I do? Is it really, is it any more complex than the items listed here? And does it in any way involve complex structure? Mm -hmm. So, Jake, talk to me about this tire. Talk to me about if you weren't an AMP mechanic, mm -hmm. let's talk about wheels, tires, brakes, 
struts. What can you do here? Yeah, so I think um, the important thing to think about here is um, it, it's very broad, like what is a complex issue or what is a complex task or operation? And uh, what we tried to do um, when we were thinking about this before is um, looking at the tasks that were already preventative maintenance or preventive mm -hmm. maintenance and um, thinking about in other scenarios if they were more complex or mm -hmm. they involved more steps. Um, and there's, there's some interesting things that you have to do to take a tire off or to replace a tire that aren't listed in preventive maintenance. Yeah, so like go through that. Take us through what do you have to do to replace a tire on a general aviation aircraft? Um, yeah, so the first thing that you have to do is um, take the or jack the airplane up, which is, uh, I don't believe that it's uh, in this. They don't list that, but sure. So the act of taking you gotta jack the, the plane tire up. yourself. You got to get the tire off the ground. Exactly. Um, and then what you have to do is on the back side of the tire, um, the disc, which is connected to the wheel, uh, has cal or has um, uh, pads on both sides. And you can only take the tire off or the wheel off um, with the outside um, pad off. So right. the act so of the you, brake caliper yeah. has to come apart. Yes, exactly. So that act of you replacing the tire, which is a preventive maintenance action, requires you to not disassemble the caliper, but kind of disassemble <laughs> to a point you're disassembling point. what the caliper is. Yeah. Yeah. And in many cases you're taking it you're taking it out of where it slides into. You mm -hmm. might be taking the the pressure plate might be uh, uh, the plate might be coming off that has the friction plate. Yeah. Um yeah. So you so you've got parts of the caliper apart. Yeah. What's next? So the next thing that you have to do is take the cotter pin out and uh then when you uh, unscrew the nut. Well, let me add one thing here. Okay. Safety. Safety, safety, safety. And that is, we're going to have to dis deflate the tire first. Yes. Before we take any pressure off this. Yes. Get the air out. Yes. And uh, so, of course, that's another issue that was actually brought up uh, in the Khalil um, letter. And so as we do that, now we have the tire off. But we have the act of doing that. We have to, uh, of course, after all the air is taken out, um, we have to uh, uh, disassemble the wheel because the wheel is uh, in two pieces. You have an outside part and an inside part. One is connected to the disc right. and uh, one is bolted in. So the act of you trying to look for the tire, now you're disassembling the wheel, mm -hmm. which is a big issue as well. Yeah, so most of, of if, if you, for anyone who hasn't done this before, um, it's actually pretty simple, uh, but uh, you, you've generally got three bolts and most of our wheels on general aviation aircraft are in halves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they just pop off. And, yep. and one half has the brake disc on it. Yep. And that kind of often comes off as part of this when you pull the bolts out, um, certainly. Uh, and so you've, you've, you've taken all this apart now mm -hmm. just to get at this tire and tube. Yeah. Oh, and while you're in there, we know that one of the items that the FAA says you can do is your wheel bearings. Yeah, so they actually say, um, I forget which number it was, but you can re-grease the wheel bearings. Yep, clean and grease them. Clean and grease them, which uh, involves you uh, taking the snap ring out, taking uh, the whole uh, bearing out, you're cleaning the bearing. So at that point, can you replace the bearing? And because it's not any more complex, you're already taking the bearing out, you're already repacking the bearing. And that's where um, uh, the line is kind of mushy and you have to figure out what is a complex operation. Right. So. I think the first question that's con that comes up with this, and I'm keeping an eye on all the comments I'm getting from, from you, view, everyone out there watching, and we'll, we'll work some of these in as best we, best we can. The first thing that comes up is, if you're taking something apart, if you're holding the part in your hand, can you change it? Can you get a new one? Mm -hmm. And I think based on both the list and the Khalil interpretation, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. The precedent is already set, you can change a tire. You're not, they're not saying you can take a tire off and you put the same tire back on. Mm -hmm. So we know you can do that. They're already saying that you can uh, take all of these things apart, hold these parts in your hand separately. Um, that includes something like, let's say the brake disc. Yeah. Can you put a new brake disc on, your, on yourself uh, on an aircraft? 
-hmm. My interpretation as an AP and IA based on this and the Khalil interpretation is it is not part of the primary structure of the aircraft. It's not part of the airframe. It is a task that is absolutely in line with everything you're being told to do, and they have told you it's non-inclusive. Absolutely. Absolutely, I can do that. Mm -hmm. It just happened in the course of changing the tire. It's the same concept. Yep. And the same is true when you talk about replacing parts like the, uh, um, like, like the uh, uh, bearings. Mm -hmm. They are explicitly telling you, you can take a bearing out. You can clean a bearing. You can look at it. Every part gets inspected before you put back on, regrease it. There's no reason it has to be the same bearing. You can put a new bearing in. But this also brings up another issue, which we were actually talking about in the three-hour drive uh, back from Clemson. And so you're taking the uh, brake liner or the, the uh, outside part of the brake caliper out. Um, and so you have it in your hand and you're inspecting it and you realize that it needs to be replaced. Well, can you change the brake lining in mm -hmm. that case? And that was the conversation that we were trying to have. Is that considered a complex operation? I think we had and a your answer different opinion. So what I was uh, thinking is I couldn't find a uh, lit or an item on the prevent or preventive maintenance uh, list that really coincides with the task of uh, taking out the rivets and then putting new rivets in. And, that, and that's the key the lining. And it, I think that was the key is that different task of uh, changing those rivets makes it complex, makes it complex. And that was my interpretation of it. Yeah. And so our linings on bra on, on uh, our brake systems and lining, we mean in cars, we call them a brake pad. And uh, when you get it on a car, the, the friction material is already bonded to the metal and that's permanent in aircraft. It's not. They, are, they have soft brass rivets mm -hmm. that, have to, that, that attach linings to these cast pieces. And um, when, we, when you do that, that becomes a complex operation. They can give it to someone else or you can get all brand new or something where you are not doing any riveting, mm -hmm. right? Like the backing plate that's got it or hand it to someone else or drop yeah. it off at your AMP or, you mm -hmm. know, whatever. In theory, you have the ability of putting it back on, but you do not, I don't think have anything that gives you justification through this role mm -hmm. to change it because we're talking complex operations. Yeah, now. yeah. From my understanding of it, um, it seemed like that was getting into the complex side because there wasn't anything specific that uh, was really like um, that operation. Right. So now you've got, so when you think about it, you've got the, you've got the ability they're giving you, your wheels apart, your, 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 uh, you've got your wheel, you've got your part of your brake components are off, um, you've got the uh, uh, bearings mm -hmm. uh, all set. And then we've got this section even about servicing Oleo struts mm -hmm. with air, yep. oil, or both. This one I find a little bit interesting too because nitrogen is really what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. They call it air, but really it's nitrogen that, yeah. that's used on, on almost all struts. Uh, if you do use air on your aircraft, I'd recommend that you use nitrogen instead because uh, it's an inert gas and it essentially will be drier and prevent you from having corrosion and moisture inside uh, and causing issues for your Aleo struts. Um, but uh, that's under high pressure. That kind of surprised, you know, you're talking a mm -hmm. lot of pressure. Most aircraft are anywhere from, you know, 100, 500 pounds mm -hmm. uh, and you need a special setup for it. Uh, so it kind of surprises me, but they tell you, you can, you can do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can be a pretty like dangerous operation too. You have to understand the equipment. You have to understand what goes into uh, setting the oleo strip to the correct pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings us into another issue, which um, I think you can talk about, which is um, A&Ps, IAs, and owners and operators, we all fall under the same category where we need the information to be able to prop and we need the information and techniques and experience in order to do things like this. Good point. Right. So the bottom line is when you're an AMP or an IA for that matter, it doesn't matter. The FAA has these guidelines that apply no matter what. There's this catch all because AMPs, the mechanics we all trust, uh, their license basically to work on any part of any aircraft essentially mm -hmm. and now not any part i mean get radios and stuff but in general it's like it could be a 747 it could be a piper cub 
the catch-all is that you need th this list of things for anything you're going to do and these same rules apply to you as an aircraft owner operator doing preventive maintenance. Number one, you need to have the experience and training. You have to have been told how to do this. You need to know how to do this operation properly mm -hmm. and have the proper experience. You can't just learn on the job for the first time how to like do a rivet on a brake uh, on a brake lining. Mm -hmm. You need to know how to do it. Number two, you need the maintenance uh, manuals. You have to be following the proper maintenance manuals for the aircraft or the component or the engine or whatever it is you're working on. You have to have the manuals and you have to follow them. And then the next thing is, number three, you've got to actually have the proper tools to do the job. Uh, you, the all end, those tools, to have proper tools means those tools actually have to be calibrated mm -hmm. if they are like a torque wrench. Mm -hmm. So you can't just willingly do whatever you want. Your mechanic has rules. They get inspected and audited. They have to have torque wrenches that have been inspected with, uh, and, and calibrated within a year. If you're going to be putting doing this work, even this wheel we talked about, mm -hmm. you know, 90 inch pounds and uh, on putting a, you know caliper bolts back together and putting the wheel halves back together, you can't skip any of this. The same responsibilities lie on you as do a mechanic doing the job. Mm -hmm. And then the last part of this, which is also really important, I'm going to show my screen on this one, is you actually do a logbook entry. You have to do this. You have the same responsibilities for logging your work as do the mechanics. And so what does that mean? A logbook entry here, a description of the work performed or references to the data that's acceptable, the date of completion, um, the signature, certificate number, kind of certificate. And I put uh, that, that that's here. And that's what you're doing when you sign something in a logbook. And this is also important for you to know for any other, anyone else signing your logbook. You are only t uh, putting your signature on your responsibility of returning the aircraft to service for the task that you have listed. Mm -hmm. It does not mean you inspected the aircraft anywhere outside that. It doesn't mean you saw anything else. It doesn't mean you're responsible for anything else. So this is an example here of like an oil change. You have the date, you have the amount of time on the airframe, the amount of time on the engine, and then you say what you did. Drained oil, replaced oil, um, what you put in, what the filter was, um, uh, the, uh, you know, whatever it is that you put in here and then your name. And instead of having a mechanic information below that, it's who you are. And, uh, that fact you write owner and then your pilot license number, because that is, that's your certification of why you were legal to work on this aircraft. So those things are what's key to, uh, to having in here. And I want to make one other note, which which has come up in, in a number of cases I've seen come up. And this is for work that you do and enter in your own logbook. And uh, it's um, uh, and it's also uh, something you should never tolerate. You should be careful of anyone writing in your logbook who's a mechanic. And that is you are writing down in your logbook a description of the task you performed, mm -hmm. the work that was done on the aircraft. Um, you are not writing why. You are not putting anything in here about the part that was removed. Um, when a mechanic or someone else does something to your aircraft, they don't say you should never let something into there that says like, you know, uh, um, golf cart hit uh, left aileron, left aileron replaced. <laughs> you just write replaced, that's it. And this is important to protect the value of your aircraft also. you you. You don't want misleading things in there. You don't want something that's going to look different. And also, it's irrelevant. If a part has been replaced, then what happened or the reason for it does not belong in your logbook. Uh, okay, let me turn this back off there. And yes, I already received a correction. Yes, it should be certificate number, not license number there, but that was just an example. Um, we just threw together really quick. Um, and uh, so another person asked a question here about, you know, inspection and if you're working on any part uh, well the manual doesn't say something about inspection so the FAA 
when they think about the word inspection, that's a very special word. We use the word inspection in um, only very specific cases when we think legal and FAA. What are, the, what, what are some examples of inspections? Uh, like an annual inspection is right. only the inspection part, not the one performed. Annual, 100 hour inspection. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Progressive inspection. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, if you want to use it in kind of layman's terms, we're inspecting things every time we touch them. You're, you're in, when you do a pre-flight, you're inspecting it. You find a loose screw, needs to be tightened. You find something else, you find that the air is low on your tire, you've inspected it. Inspection is a broad term. And again, we go fall back to you need the proper training or the proper manuals or the proper documentation. Mm -hmm. So how do you know as a aircraft owner or operator that those wheel bearings that you were just looking at um, need to be replaced? And so you're not just going to grease it. You're just actually going to put another one, new one in. Um, you know through either bringing it to someone to have them tell you who is qualified to do that and them training you as part of that so you can understand that that's necessary. Um, if it's, let's say it was the uh, brake disc, uh, you know, you're, it's sitting on a shelf, can you put another one on? It's no more complex of an operation and it is part of it. Can you actually switch that out? I believe the answer is, is yes and would survive all of this. How do you know? You go to the manual from the wheel and brake company, which specifically says, this is how wide it's gonna be. Matter of fact, mm -hmm. we just got, I just got back from Sun and Fun. You go to Sun and Fun, you go to uh, Oshkosh and uh, Air Venture, and uh, they love to give away their little gauges that tell you what thicknesses are, and is it like pad, go, no go gauges. Mm -hmm. There are ways of doing these things, and um, that, I believe, not constituting an official annual 100 hour or progressive inspection, those are legitimate ways that you can decide you want to replace something and you are always there. We are not encouraging anybody to do something they're not qualified for uh, or encouraging you to do something that you shouldn't uh, and, and don't feel that is proper. You can always just take it to someone, have it measured and have them tell you, here's the book, here's what this says and it shouldn't go back on your plane. And I, I think that's um, kind of covers any operation that you're ever gonna do. If you get a new tire, you need to make sure that the tire is uh, round. You need to make sure that the tire that you're putting on is good and having the proper experience and having the proper manuals um, is gonna help you determine whether the part is not only the correct part, but that the part was manufactured properly as well. Right, and, and you know, again, none of these things should happen um, before, without someone teaching you, without some, someone training you. And mechanics have this happen. Mechanics go through this constantly. It never, ever, ever ends. I had a um, uh, a tire uh, replacement that I did on on our own plane a while ago, and I put on a uh, brand new tires. And I went and 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 splurged for the best tires that uh, that money could buy at the time, and and uh, got everything all set. Got out there, looked great. Got out there, went taxied. Womp, womp, womp. Like I was like. Yeah. Okay, this is less than satisfying. Um, it went back, took it all. Uh, it took, you know, looked at it, and I didn't see anything. And I went and contacted the manufacturer, um, who I'm very inten intentionally not naming. Um, contacted them, and they explained that there is a ring specifically molded into the aircraft tire, and that you could measure from that ring out to see if the tire was out of round, brand new, had a manufacturing defect, here's how you do it. I didn't know that that ring was specifically molded in the tire for that purpose, mm -hmm. and that that's how you go and can take a caliper and check these things. Um, I found that out from the manufacturer. I was trained by doing that. That's how I determined that that, that tire was out of spec and had to be um, uh, retired. Uh, for warranty <laughs> and replaced. So these are the resources that are available to you. Now we got another question that came in that had to do with um, uh, what constitute does what goes in a logbook, what doesn't go into a logbook. And this kind of goes back to that Khalil letter, C O L E A L. I'd, I'd encourage people to go look at. Uh, it's a longer letter than we just showed here, um, and it's interesting because they answer some of those questions from the FAA's legal interpretation because this again was the question of what's consider, what goes in there, what's considered uh, kind of pre-flight tasks 
versus maintenance versus preventive maintenance. What category is all this in? Mm -hmm. Now, they looked at the, at the tire of that Learjet 60 and came back and said, uh, do, on a normal tire, adding air would be a pre-flight task. Mm -hmm. Checking air, adding air, pre-flight task. Uh, pre-flight tasks don't go in your maintenance book. Doesn't qualify as, as, uh, as either maintenance or preventive maintenance. However, due to the complexity of the operation on that aircraft and the fact that it required, required high pressure and that, and that due to the manufacturer's statement, it had to be checked by a calibrated um, air pressure gauge, that put it into the category of, of a type of maintenance, not pre-flight, just a pre-flight task. And then they interpreted based on that information and based on the aircraft being in part 91, that it was preventive maintenance. Well, that means it actually goes in the logbook, which is interesting because that's an air mm -hmm. check that goes in the logbook. Mm -hmm. Now, personally, remember your logbook doesn't have to be the logbook like you have, it, it, can, it can be anything. And so a logbook in the case of that Learjet operator could be, this is nothing but speculation and, and legal interpretation, as a, as a, you know, mm -hmm. my speculation on the legal interpretation, um, could be a sheet of paper with a log that has all that information. Who did it? What's the date? What's the hours on the aircraft? Mm -hmm. Here's the task that was performed. Here's the signature. Mm -hmm. so you're talking about just like a spreadsheet yeah. of just uh, checking and maybe adding air to the tire. Right. On that aircraft, mm -hmm. because of the complexity, the high pressure and the the, the requirement for it to be a calibrated instrument. Yeah. So they have to log it, and that becomes part of the aircraft log logs. But just because it's a sheet doesn't mean that you want to go in there and have like a thousand entries for a thousand takeoffs and landings this aircraft has had mm -hmm. it mixed in with major maintenance replacing an engine. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's obviously very different. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, what else do we have here? That's some um, some good questions. How about changing a faulty ignition harness as the owner or, or, or operator of the aircraft? Um, I know many people have done something like this, and uh, you could you could you could argue this either way. Um, I, I don't think you could really get into trouble, is my guess, with something like this. You certainly know you can take off one half of this because it's attached to the spark plugs, mm -hmm. and they let you do that all day long. It gets a little grayer. Is it complicated? in most aircraft to take the cap off where the harness attaches to the magneto? No, yeah. no. But how is it secured? Where is it going? What Adele clamps is it attached to going through here? And is there actually complexity? How do you know that you're really attaching the left to the left, the right to the right? You can introduce some very serious problems if you get it wrong. If you put the wrong one on there and you get your firing order wrong. So there's an argument to be made on this. I'm not gonna have a I'm not gonna make a judgment call myself on it right now, but there's an argument to be made on this that if you were to do this task wrong, um, yeah, you can mess up mess up the firing order of the of the aircraft. And so a harness probably isn't something that's included in that. There's also an argument that could say that if in this aircraft that you are looking at, that that is not the case that it is very straightforward, very obvious, and cannot actually be easily messed up. For example, many harnesses come from the manufacturer, wired, labeled, and set in such a way that you can't mm -hmm. get it the wrong way. Perhaps you could argue the other way on that one, but that's a very, very good question, so I appreciate you doing that. Another question we got is, what counts as, as training uh, on, on something like that? Does the training uh, uh, on, on procedures, does it, does it have to be recorded, can it be named AMP mechanic, something like that? Mm -hmm. what, what's your answer on what constitutes, do you have the, the proper training to do something? Yeah, I think, I mean, that can also be a tricky one to figure out, like, do you have the proper training? And I would think even as an A&P, you're, you're constantly looking for more and more training, constantly looking for more uh, experience to be able to do a task. Um, and I think it, it's really a personal decision. I think if you're really ready, of course you need the maintenance logs or uh, the maintenance manuals um, and you need the proper uh, resources in order mm -hmm. to do that. 
but just being under the supervision of another a and p you feel like you uh, have the tools to do that in my opinion you could be ready if you have the resources to do the task yourself right keep in mind that the biggest difference between a mechanic and an owner on these types of tasks are mechanics are trained to work on all sorts of aircraft whatever pulls into their shop they are qualified and they're there to do this the faa created this category to facilitate good proper preventive maintenance and and keep aircraft in as airworthy condition as possible for the owner or operator of that aircraft that means the bar is much lower because it's more specific you don't need to know how to do all sorts of different types you need to have the proper quote training for your aircraft for this aircraft mm -hmm. to know how to do these tasks which means being shown how to do it by someone who uh, you could point to and say he trained you that matters but we're talking everything right what's the proper training use a torque wrench you have to know that you have to hold a torque wrench in the right place you have to know how to use that torque wrench properly so some of this is the FAA's uh, guidance saying learn how to do these things you need to get experience and they're trying to encourage you in the right direction to make sure you don't just do something there should be zero guesswork mm -hmm. we're telling you how to do something on your plane there should be zero guesswork. You should know how to use your tools. You should know what you're doing. You should have the manuals, et cetera. The other side of it, quite frankly, I believe is a catch-all that gives the FA the power to do enforcement actions against people when they really do things that they shouldn't be or they do it wrong. And so it's a catch-all for mechanics. It's a catch-all for owners and operators that if something happens because of something you did, and they can simply come in and say, show me, you obviously did it wrong, so show me how you had the proper training. Well, at that point in time, if you wanted to get out on that clause, you do need to be able to say, this is the mechanic who showed me how to do it. This is the date he did it. He showed me what to do. I did receive the proper training. I just didn't do it right. And so that's where, when you look at a gray situation of, who has to teach it to me? How do I get the information? Um, that's that's where on one end it's all about the you know the carrot, do it right, and then you also have to be aware of the stick. Mm -hmm. uh, if something gets messed up, are you going to have a good answer to that? Um, let's see. Next question: As an owner, how much of my annual inspection can I do myself if I am not an AMP? Great question. Thank you for asking this. So, who can work on an aircraft, Jake? Uh, well, according to this whole thing, I mean, well, any, in any who can work on an aircraft anyway? Yeah, I mean, anyone can work on an aircraft if you're under the supervision. I think that's really what matters. Yes. So the FAA's uh, regulations do not say anything about who has to swing the wrench in any circumstance. It doesn't. It, it literally doesn't matter. There, there are shops doing extraordinarily complex work on aircraft and you might walk in there and walk up to someone who's doing really deep complex work on an airplane and say hey do you have an AMP license and they might even say what's an AMP license <laughs> nope, <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, no anyone can work on an aircraft however all of that work is done under the supervision of someone who is qualified to do that work. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the key. That's how they look at everything. The um, I was talking to Jake about this earlier today. It's like you have a you have new minted ink isn't dry yet on your certificate as an AMP. And he's like, what kind of things would you do? Would wouldn't you do out there? And it came down to this thing. What was it like? What's the, what's that one word I said is or the one thing is the most important. Well, I can make logbook entries, and that's that's what changed. Out right. of everything, that's really what changed. Other than that, I still have to be under the supervision if I haven't had the proper experience to do something. Um, everything really stays the same, but I can and make logbook entries. And what's entries. the one to worry about doing on some planes? It would be the logbook entry. Yeah. <laughs> so. Exactly. That's what you worry about, right? Even in liability, 
uh, or or something like that. Like you, the logbook entry is what stays. The logbook entry is what stays with the aircraft for the rest mm -hmm. of its life. The logbook entry is where the lawyers go when yeah. they want to blame someone <laughs> and they want to go through and find out who touched this aircraft. Mm -hmm. The logbook entry is the part that is mechanics and you should as well as an owner. We should be the most wary of and make sure we know what we're doing mm -hmm. and we're accepting the, the responsibility for this work. Mm -hmm. The difference comes in with that word we talked about earlier, inspection, because that is different. Uh, anyone can do work on an aircraft. Not anyone can do a legal inspection on an aircraft. And so what inspections now are you legally allowed to do on aircraft? I can do a 100-hour inspection. Right. So an A&P can do a 100-hour inspection. An IA, like myself, can do either progressive or an annual inspection on an aircraft. And that means we're the ones. Now, we can't sub that work out. We are the ones who have to put eyes on the part, who have to go through the ADs, who have to like know that the, we're the ones certifying that it's done that. We can't say, hey, did you check such and such? And someone else says, oh, yeah, I checked it. And I go, okay, <laughs> good enough. Um, nope, we're the inspector. Uh, and so that's the key difference. Uh, so hopefully that answers that question. Uh, let's see, what else we have? We've got... Um, Experimental aircraft, uh, that's an interesting one as well. For those of you, we, you know, you may know, of course, we're building a, a T-51 Mustang um, ourselves. Uh, when we finish that, we will be able, uh, regardless of having uh, an AMP license, we are, uh, we're legally allowed to do inspections on that. Um, and so if, with experimental aircraft, if you are the manufacturer of the aircraft. And by that mean, I don't mean the kit manufacturer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're the 51% builder. Yes. Then you are issued at that time the certificate that allows you to do the ins all the required inspections on that aircraft. Um, as an owner or operator of that aircraft, you can do the same maintenance as is what as we've been talking about here, just like any other Part 91 operated mm -hmm. aircraft. But inspections, now we have taken the same thing. It's only the 100 hour perhaps by uh, an AMP, um, the annual progressive inspection by an IA. And then there's this new person, the builder of the aircraft, who can also do the actual annual inspection on that. So hopefully that, um, that helps. Um, Doing the inspection, disassemble and clean prior. Um, on, is an annual the same as a 100-hour inspection? Excellent question. Excellent question. In most cases, if you look at the checklist requirements and the definitions of a 100-hour versus an annual inspection, in most cases, it is actually, that's actually correct. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the engine part, I believe that you're able to do as an AMP, but yeah, the hundred, you, you can certify, you can do a hundred hour inspection, but the FAA literally does divide the line and say only the IA can do it annually. And I think their goal here is to simply have some controls on the process to simply say, um, you know, if an aircraft's in a flight school, if it's operated in some other way, or if it's it's putting on, if it's if 100 hours required, we're going to lower the bar. We're going to let any A and P work on it. But once a year, we want to make sure that this magical person we have endowed with this, you know, and and, and said you're going to be and then have an inspection authorization. An IA gets there once a year on the uh, on the aircraft. Um, so that's um, that hopefully helps helps answer that one. Um, someone talked about uh, swapping uh, tires and wheel assemblies for straight skis. In some cases, it, remo it includes, they said, removing brake calipers and capping brake lines, plus rigging the skis by attaching support cables. So, you know, this is where it gets really gray because the, um, the FAA has a little, you know, they have a catch for themselves. And if, you're, if, if your particular aircraft and setup is such that, um, that it's going to be considered a complex operation, then you either need an interpretation for that to make you feel good, at least from the from FISDO to protect yourself, 
or um, uh, or you just decide you're not going to do that. But I understand this particular case is 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 you know is complex in its question because um, on one hand they say swap wheels and skis. Like okay, they're telling me I can swap wheels and skis. Mm -hmm. Wheels have brakes. Like they must be whatever. Um, they must have thought that you're going to take a caliper off. Well, if you take a caliper off and put it back on, you're going to have to bleed it. Um, I think, you know, it, it, I can only give just, you know, a, 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 an opinion out there, but it depends on the aircraft. If you have the training, if you've done that, you literally could sit there and say, look, you told me I could do this. You told me I could do that. And there is nothing complicated about doing this particular task. When you start getting into rigging, when you start getting into more, that was part of your question to the uh, viewer who asked about um, ribbing, rigging things and bleeding brakes, is this really complex? Um, at the end of the day, you're leaving some leeway here, in my personal opinion, um, to have a problem with the, the, the FAA if there were an accident. Um, so if an accident occurred, they could point to that in some way. Your insurance company says, I don't understand, why was this okay? And you're somewhere, caught in limbo because everyone's going to want to point as they always do to who worked on the aircraft and say was this done properly and was it legal for them to do it i would want uh if i were you to get a letter from fisdo that says um yeah given this given the khalil thing we think it's okay for you to do this and that may not be a legal interpretation it probably is just for you but um it would make me feel better at night mm -hmm. i'd sleep better at night with something like that um Take a look if there's uh, anything else here as we're getting very close to the end of our hour. Um, FA definition between aircraft owner and operator. That's an excellent one at all. The, the operator of the aircraft is the operator at any given moment of that aircraft. Um, mm -hmm. So we're talking pilot. Uh, uh, you know, if you're flying the aircraft, you're, you're the operator. Um, it, it, you know, you can take any rule and try to get into real corner cases. And as, as with everything, if you are intentionally skirting the rules, if I'm going to have a buddy of mine who doesn't fly my plane, who's never flown my plane, and just say, hey, can you go over and do this stuff on my plane and throw it in a logbook entry? Again, it's all great until there's some type of an incident and the FAA is mm -hmm. digging in and now you're caught where you're going to have to say, no, he flies the plane. He was an operator of the plane. Mm -hmm. um, I would stay away from things like that. Um, we, uh, I think we addressed some of the other things that had to do with that. I think as we wrap up here, uh, one of the most important things, of course, is, is moving forward. We didn't get into a lot of uh, any real detail of how-tos, and, and I want to do that for you. Um, I want to get into some, you know, I want to be able to do some how-tos on, on, uh, on, on maintenance, on mm -hmm. what you should look for. Um, you know, you've got oil changes that are important, spark plug work, mm -hmm. um, uh, wheels, tires, brakes, all these kinds of things. Um, let us know. Give us some feedback. If you'd like to have some shows on these types of topics, we will, of course, be having Mike Bush come back. We have lots of other people to interview as part of Social Flight Live. Um, and uh, but, but we really want to hear from you. And when you post the comments or when you email us, we will do our best to actually make sure that, uh, that we help you with that. But the, the goal tonight, more than anything, is to hopefully help you out a little bit with um, what you can do, how that has changed over the years, and how it's kind of open to interpretation a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, one, another one just came up recently that I was involved in, I'll throw in there, and that is, you know, a, a good example. Someone said they had a Cirrus, and they said um, Cirrus came out with a service kit to replace the uh, a door gasket, uh, and um, with a much better one upgraded. Can I do that? And, you know, when you, and the, the answer is, uh, when we pulled mechanics and looked around, is that um, if you look at uh, the other tasks and the complexity involved with with doing those things, and you look at decorative finish pieces, you look at side windows, things like that, um, can you remove this? The answer became yes. That was mm -hmm. our recommendation, yeah. is that, that even though it's not on the list, that was something that I think could be preventive maintenance. Um, uh, so with that, I'll put one other little thing out there, and that is, you know, anytime you're opening up something on an aircraft, anytime you're working on it, use this as an opportunity to explore all of it, to improve, to get someone to help you, uh, quote, inspect, not the official term, um, 
whatever it is. We talked about all these things that come apart if you're just going to change your tire. Mm -hmm. What a great time not to wait for your annual to make sure that you're checking everything, mm -hmm. you're getting it all cleaned up, mm -hmm. that you don't put anything back together that you haven't already gone and made sure your wheel bearings are good and your brake pads look right and they've measured according to what you're told by the manufacturer yeah. and, and your you know, caliper is moving freely. Exactly. Like Lubrication yeah. and things like that. Mm -hmm. Everything fits. Um, so, uh, and, and you know, there's, there's a lot to do. So um, with that, again, I'd like to thank you all. I want to personally, again, congratulate Jake uh, for, uh, for making such a big uh, jump today into the world of aircraft maintenance. Um, and, and to thank you all for taking time, as always, out of your evening to join us. Give us some feedback. Let us know what you like. Please check it over on YouTube as well. You'll be able to see that. And get the app. Uh, uh, check out socialflight.com on the web. And also, of course, get the free app. There is still time to win that Lightspeed headset. All oh, that Zulu 3. I love that thing. Mm -hmm. Get get in there. Be one of those people. I want you to be the one that we announce is the winner of that coming in uh, in May. We're going to award that uh, uh, very, uh, May 1st. We'll choose that person. We'll inform them, and then we'll come inform the rest of you. With that, I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us and take time out of your evening, and I wish you all blue skies. <laughs>